everyone. My name is Carl Diaz. I'm with the Learning Resources Center here at the University of Colorado, Denver. And today we're going to be talking about some ideas with conservation and momentum. So we've got three questions here that we're going to kind of work through, so let's get started. All right, so the first question is talking about two balls, right? Both these balls, one ball is bouncy, one ball is sticky. Okay, and this is a bowling pin or a brick. I think we call it a brick here. And we want to know which one of these two balls has a more likely chance of knocking the brick over and which ball has the larger impulse. Okay, so uh, in order to do that, uh, we were only given certain things though. We were only given the mass and velocity, right? So what that means is that we can really only look at changes in momentum. The thing that we know though is that a change in momentum is equal to impulse, right? We know the impulse is Ft, right? And we know the change in momentum, right, is equal to the impulse. We know this equation is true, right? So, and if you don't know, go watch the concept video because we talk about that in the concept video uh, for um, conservation of momentum. So, that means if we can find the change in momentum, we can find the impulse. And if we can find the impulse, whoever has a larger impulse has a more likely chance of, of knocking over the pin, or whoever has the larger change in momentum is a better way to say, has a better chance of knocking over the pin. So, what we do is we start to look at these situations. So this bouncy ball is gonna have initial velocity this way and the final velocity this way where our sticky ball is just going to have initial velocity this way and it's going to stick, right? So there's no final velocity that's going to be uh, for the sticky ball, right? So if we want to look in terms of momentum, right? And I probably should have written this up there. Uh, uh, I just, for some reason, left it off. I had the initial and the final here, but not here. So we know the P final is going to be equal to zero. I should have known that. Okay, so for this bouncy ball, we know the initial momentum right, is going to be, the, oops, I have a negative sign there, that's my fault, it's the final way gets a negative sign, so P initial, right, the momentum in the initial direction is in the positive x direction, so we write it as mvi, right, the final momentum, right, is this, that, that velocity is telling us the direction, which is in the negative direction, so that's mv, right, so the final momentum is, is negative because of the direction it is, and initial momentum is positive, okay? So now remember, momentum's a vector, so we're using vector signs again, um, not like work or something like this, okay? So, uh, uh, once we know our momentums, we can uh, look at our changes in momentum uh, for the bouncy ball. And before we do that, let's look at our momentum for the sticky ball. So we know that the sticky ball has an initial momentum of, and again, I have a center, um, of mv, but we know that the final momentum, right, is going to be zero, right, because it's going to stick, so there's no bounce back, it's not going to have any velocity, final velocity, and if it has no final velocity, we know momentum's mv, so velocity is zero, the momentum is zero, right? So, we want to then look at the changes in these momentums. We know change in momentum is final minus initial, right? That's what we know. And so uh, with this one, when we put it into the equation, we see that since fine, the negative is, or the final momentum is negative, we keep that subtraction sign. What ends up happening, right, is these values end up adding, right? When we have two negatives like that, they essentially add, is the idea. So when they're adding, that means we get a larger number than initially, right? So we see for the bouncy ball, right, when these two and the final initial velocities add, right, and the, and the final initial momentum is essentially, I'm just looking at these there, but that should be including the m's, uh, but the m's aren't the vector there, so I'm, I'm, I'm not putting the m's in there, I do put them back in here, right? We can see that they're going to have a larger change in momentum based off of the velocities, right? We're here, right? this change in momentum for the sticky ball, right, is gonna be small because we just have one initial velocity, right? So here we have a much larger number because we're adding two numbers, where here it's just the one number, um, that initial velocity that we have here. So the change in momentum then, right, is essentially, and I should have written it here, is gonna be 
this, right? It's initial, it's final, right? This is the change in momentum where we're adding those things. And so if we know impulse is equal to change in momentum, we can write that out that way. So we say the impulse is equal to this change in momentum where this right here is the entire change in momentum, including the mass, right? Where this was just the velocity. So I put it in there. And when we do that for both equations, right? We put the momentum, the change in momentum for the, bat, for the sticky ball as well. We can see that, again, that change in momentum is equal to impulse. So the larger change in momentum, which is from the sticky ball, right? Is gonna have the larger impulse. The smaller change in momentum has a smaller impulse. So that means that the larger momentum has, it's going to be applying a larger force, so it's going to have a better chance of knocking the pin over. So the bouncy ball has a larger chance of knocking the pin over because it has a larger change in momentum. That's why, okay? And we say this right here, bouncy ball has a larger change in momentum and a larger impulse, which means bouncy ball has a better chance of knocking brick over. Okay, it's about the larger change in impulse gives, I mean, the larger change in momentum gives us that impulse and tells us exactly what is going to happen. All right. Um, it's just, I see a lot of students want to do this. The reason why I'm bringing that up is because we know this and I see a lot of students say, okay, well, force is equal to MV over T and for the sticky or for the bouncy ball, T is really small. So F is really large. Yeah, that's true. And for this one, right? The sticky, the ball essentially sticks and T goes to infinity. So when this, when T is really large, F becomes really small, right? Because of that inverse relationship. For a larger, smaller T, the bouncy ball has a larger force, larger T, infinity here, because it's sticking, you, you have a smaller force. You could think of it that way, but we don't want you thinking about it this way. We want you looking at these situations in terms of momentum and impulse, okay? Because that's what we're trying to understand right now is momentum and impulse. We understand force directly. Okay, so that it's just understanding the idea, um, if that makes sense. So, for the next situation, we have a large and a small block. They're moving towards each other on a frictionless surface, and then they collide and bounce apart. So this is the initial, and this is the final, right? This is the initial, this is the final situation, okay? So, uh, we're asked a few questions. Which exerts more force during the collision? Is the time interval for the collision the same for both boxes, I should have probably finished that off. Are the impulses the same for both, both boxes and which block has a greater change in momentum? All right, well, again, which exerts more force during the collision? Well, we know because of Newton's third law that every action has a reaction. So if two objects come in contact with each other, they're gonna exert the same force on each other. We know that. Go watch the Newton law concept video if you don't know that that's super important to know. So if these things come in contact, it doesn't matter how small the thing is or large the thing is or how fast one of them is moving versus the other one, right? When they collide, they're going to exert the same force on one another. Size and speed doesn't matter, okay? So which exerts more force during the collision? It's equal and opposite because of Newton's third law, okay? We know this, all right? So that's the answer to the first question. They're equal and opposite. Same force during the, no one exerts more force. They exert the same force, even though they have different masses. One's larger than the other. B, is the time interval for the collision the same? Well, it's, I don't know what universe you're living in, but the universe I live in is it's, how can this marker spend more contact with this marker than this marker spending with this one, right? It's like, I don't even know how to show that situation. It doesn't exist. Okay, so that's the, that's the thing to take in here. You, shouldn't, you should just think logistic, think logically, right? Think of the reality and say it's impossible for one object to be in contact for less or more time than the other object for any given situation. So they're spending the same time together is what we're saying. The collision, the time spent in the collision is the same. And the force during that collision is the same. That's what these two things are trying to say, is that for, this one's trying to say that force one to two is equal to force two to one. And this is trying to say that time one is equal to time two. They spend the same time together. That's what we're trying to say. Okay, 
So, are the impulses the same? Well, we just got done talking about this, right? We know that this side, this is impulse, right? So if we want to look at the impulse, we look at FT, right? And so are the impulses the same or are they different? Well, we just said that both blocks experience the same force and both blocks experience the same time. So the force and the time are the same, right? The force and the time with F1, F12T is equal to F21T, then that means their impulses are the same. So yes, their impulses are the same. Why? Because the forces they exert on each other in the collision are the same, and the time they spend in that collision is the same. That's it, the answer. That's why this is true, okay? Forces are the same, and time is the same, then impulse is the same for both, and we're talking about that right there. Okay, and then the last question, which block has greater change in momentum? Well, again, we just got done talking about that over here, right? That impulse is equal to the change in momentum, right? We can write this another way where it's impulse, this impulse can be equal to this change in momentum. So, we just said they have the same impulse. If the impulse is the same, then what does that mean? The change in momentum is the same. So that means the change in momentum for one is equal to the change in momentum two for the blocks, okay? So that's the answers on those, and that's how you wanna be thinking about them. Now this final one, you can use a lot of different situations. If these two people were skating towards each other and then pushed off each other, we could, we could look at the situation a little bit different. If they're both skating in the same direction and someone pushes off someone else, but then they continue to move in the same direction, we can write this a little bit different. So there's a lot of ways to write this, right? This one's very simple. They're talking about these two people, Jack and Jill, and they're, they're facing each other and they're touching and they're both just resting on the ice. And then both of them at the same time, or wait, hold on, let's see here. Yeah, Jack and Joe push on one another. So they both push on each other with the same force. So Jack's pushing this way, Jill's pushing this way, but again, they're, they're touching each other, right? So they're pushing on each other. They're touching each other initially, and they have their hands against each other, and they push off each other, okay? So after that, they both have some final velocity, is what we're saying. Initially, they're at rest, and then after that, they both have final velocities. Well, we know Jack gains his final velocity at 3.5 meters per second, right? We want to know what Jill's final velocity is. And we're given their masses, right? So again, just like we did with conservation of energy, you know, we started with this basic conservation of energy equation. We always want to start with the basic conservation of momentum equation, right? So here we know that it's this situation. This is a sticky situation, so if you're seeing Carl in the concept video, you gave us an equation for sticky. Yes, you can also write this as this, because Jill and Jack are stuck together. It's just that the velocity is zero here, right? Here we know both of these are zero. Right, because they're not moving. So either way you want to look at it, whether you want to just write the sticky equation, you can start with just a general conservation of momentum, you're going to end up with this side of the term is going to be zero, okay, because they're not moving initially. Now their final velocities, they have them, right? But before we start to work with this equation, you always want to work with signs first because these are vectors, right? So we, that's what this coordinate system is for, right? We see Jill, once they push off, is going to move in a positive x direction, where Jack's going to move in the negative, right? We've also associated Jack with V2 and Jill with V1. So in here, right, the V1, right, we're trying to say that this right here is Jill, and this right here is Jack. This is Jack's momentum, this is Jill's momentum after the collision. So Jack, if he's moving in the negative x direction, he needs to pick up, a, his momentum needs to pick up a negative sign, which is what we do, right? And then this side zero, we can make it equal to zero. And we're trying to solve for Jill's final velocity, right? That's what that is. So we just then bring Jack's momentum over, right? And then divide by Jill's mass, right? Because Jill's M1 here. All right, and then we get Jill's final velocity. That's what that is. It's that simple. All right, so again, I hope this was helpful. This is conservation momentum. It's supposed to be straightforward. 
But there's a lot more concepts that we ask you to work with here because conservation of momentum and conservation of energy are they're not just these things in physics that we developed. They are very fundamental ideas in terms of the way the universe works, right? In terms of like objects, you know, transferring momentum to each other and transferring energy to each other describes why a lot of things are doing what they're doing right now. So this stuff's important, even though, you know, it might feel a little less intuitive or maybe even more intuitive, it's super important. So, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Go back and watch this a million times. Go watch all the videos as much as you need to. Keep up the good work, and I'll see you on the next one.